This is the word of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Praise be to God. Uh, good morning. If we haven't met, my name is Scotty James. I'm the lead pastor here. I'm very blessed you decided to come uh, this Sunday morning. I believe God is going to move, and so it's going to be a good time. I want to highlight from this passage how God-centric these verses are. So I want to look through it again. God is speaking to Israel, who is up to their usual acts of idolatry and rebellion. And God says, look, looky here, Israel. I created you, verse 1. I formed you. I redeemed you. I have summoned you by my name. I will be with you when you pass through waters. Hmm. When you pass through waters, they won't sweep over you. When you walk through fire, it won't burn you. Why? Because I am the Lord God. That's why. It's because of me. Verse 3, I am the Holy One of Israel. I am your Savior. You are precious in my sight because I love you. I will give people in exchange for you. Do not be afraid because I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather them from the west. I will say to the north, give them up. These verses are all about God because Israel's existence was supposed to be all about God. These verses are all about him because their life should have been all about him. But they're up to their no good, as typical, and he's going to redeem them. He's going to save them anyway. And verse 7 gives us the reason why. Because God formed them, God created them, God made them, and it was all for God's glory. These verses, he's specifically talking to Israel, but this truth applies to all of humanity. We humans were created by God and for God. We were created by God's grace and for God's glory. Now, today is part two of a series through the doctrine of man. So let me rewind. Today is week four of a series through doctrine and theology. So it's important for me, for my church, to know what it is we believe, because we're going to live out our lives as Christ followers. It's important to know, okay, well, what do we actually affirm? So week one, we looked at Scripture and how Scripture is the inspired inerrant word of God. It is profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Why? Because all scripture is God-breathed. All scripture is inspired by God. So if you're a follower of Christ, it is the final authority in all matters of life. That was week one. Week two, we saw that we as Christ followers don't worship the same God other religions worship. And we also don't worship a general concept of God. No, we worship the triune God, the God who has intimately revealed himself as Father, Son, Spirit, all three persons fully God and yet distinct and united in one being. And so when we worship God, we don't worship a generic concept of him. No, we worship the triune God. He is who separates us. The triuneness of God is what separates the God that we, we worship from any other God on earth. That was week two. Last week, we looked at the doctrine of man, specifically how man was created. So we looked at how man was created by God, that man didn't come from monkey, man wasn't the result of some sort of explosion. No, man was created by God. Man was created in the image of God, and then God made them distinct. Male and female, he made them, and it was for a very specific purpose. It wasn't an arbitrary, random thing that God made a man and said, okay, you know what, let me give him a female. No, he said there was a very specific, intentional purpose. Distinct, male, female, equal in personhood, but distinct. And we honor God by honoring the distinctions that God has made between male and female. It's inappropriate for us as believers to do things that confuse gender. If I were to walk up here in a dress with lipstick on, it would be, it would be a disgrace. Why? Because lip is, this, lipstick is a No. Because a pink dress is a disgrace? No. So why would it be inappropriate for me to do that? Because it dishonors the distinction that God has made between male and female. A pink dress is a cultural symbol of femininity. And so for a male to adorn myself with a cultural symbol of femininity dishonors the distinction that God has made between male and female. We saw that last week, how God made them. Today we're going to see why God made mankind. What is the purpose of humanity? What is the meaning of life? That's what we're going to look at today. When you Google that, you'll find a lot of different things that pop up. And so I wanted to read you a short article or uh, an excerpt from an article. I won't say where it's from, but it's, it's a highly academic, highly intelligent thing. This is their perspective. The question of the meaning of life is perhaps one that we would 
rather not ask for the fear of the answer or lack thereof. Still today, many people believe that we, humankind, are the creation of a supernatural entity called God, that God had an intelligent purpose in creating us, and that his intelligent purpose is, purpose is the meaning of life. I do not propose to rehearse the well-worn arguments for and against the existence of God, <clears throat> but here it is. The second law of thermodynamics states that the entropy of a closed system, including the universe itself, increases up to the point at which equilibrium is reached, and God's purpose in creating us, and indeed all of nature, might have been no more lofty than to catalyze this process, much as soil organisms catalyze the decomposition of organic matter. So what he's saying is that the second law of thermodynamics states that the purpose of humanity is the purpose of all other creatures. It's pretty much to be heat dissipators that allow equilibrium to happen. So human beings were created by God simply so that creation can function and be in equilibrium. That's, that's what he's getting at. If our God-given purpose is to act as super efficient heat dissipators, then having no purpose at all is better than having this sort of purpose because it frees us to be the authors of our own purpose and so to lead truly dignified and meaningful lives. In fact, following this knowledge, this logic, having no purpose at all is better than having any kind of predetermined purpose, even a more traditional purpose or uplifting one, such as serving a God. In short, even if God did exist, and even if he had an intelligent purpose in creating us, we do not know what this purpose might be, and whatever it might be, we would be better off if we ignored it or discounted it. For unless we can be free to become the authors of our own purpose, we have no purpose at all, and it saves us from living some trivial purpose created by a trivial being. Now, if this dude is right, then my advice to all of us is that we should all live out our days on this earth in utter despair and in utter depression and that we should do whatever we can, do whatever it takes to ease the pain of purposeless, purposelessness, if he is right. If we have no purpose, or if we are created to simply make our own purpose, then there is no point in you doing good, there's no point in you being kind to your moral, uh, to, to, to your fellow man, there's no purpose in any of that at all, if this guy is right. To be created without a purpose is really to be created for the purpose of torment and torture. I see so often people who have it all, the looks, the fame, the money, the talent, and they fall into these deep depressions and drinking and all these things that destroy their lives. And oftentimes these people take their lives. And what's happening is they're in torment because they can't understand they were created for something greater than themselves. They're creating their own purpose. And when you seek out your own purpose, you realize everything in life is simply a chasing after the wind. And that's a torturous type of life. I praise God that he's not right, and I praise God that he has created human beings with purpose. So, what is it? That's what I said earlier. It's the only one in your notes. Write it down. Mankind, human beings, we were created by God's grace, and we were created for God's glory. Write that down. Remember that. Hold on to that. Teach your children that. You were created by God's grace, and you were created for God's glory. We touched on this a little bit last week. What does it mean to be created by God's grace? What that means is that the only reason mankind exists today, the only reason mankind exists, will to, exists tomorrow, is because of the grace or the loving kindness of the God who has revealed himself as Father, Son, and Spirit. Man did not earn his way into this world. Man did not deserve to be created. Man is not entitled to be created. Man was not created in response to some sort of deficiency that God had. No, man was created simply and purely by the grace of God. And man was created for the glory of God. What does that mean? Like man was created for God's glory. What is God's glory? Let's look at it. The, the Exodus chapter 19, go ahead and write that down. Exodus 19, verses 9 to 20, it gives us a picture it helps us understand a little bit about what exactly God's glory is. Go ahead and flip over to that book. Exodus 19, we'll look at verses 9 to 20. It says, The Lord said to Moses, 
I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord what the people had said. And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day. Because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, Be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. They are to be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on them. No person or animal shall be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast may they approach the mountain. After Moses had gone down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them, and they washed their clothes. Then he said to them, prepare yourselves for the third day, abstain from sexual relations. Uh, this is a side note. But what's happening right now is God is going to meet with the people, and God says, hey, tell the people to go prepare themselves, purify themselves. So they're not going to just waltz up to God and have a meeting with him. They're not going to just show up casually toward God. No, God said, make sure you're prepared to meet with me. Make sure you purify yourself to meet with me. Take three days and make sure you come correct. We'll preach on this some other time, but I would encourage you to evaluate in your life, do I prepare myself to meet with God? Do I prepare myself the night before for this interaction with God on Sunday morning? Or do I just stay up late, roll out of bed as late as I can, and just kind of just, if that's your perspective and that's your approach to God, I'd encourage you to evaluate, you know what, maybe I should change that. Maybe I should change that because maybe God would move in a greater way if I prepared to meet with him. Here, Moses says, look, be ready. You're about to meet with God. Side note, let's keep reading. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from, from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. The Lord descended on top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain, so Moses went up. God is going to come down and meet with his people, and what's happening is his glory is descending on the mountain, and there's smoke, and there's fire, and there's trumpets, and there's lightning, and there's thunder, and there's earthquakes. Like, this is a, a pretty awesome scene, the glory of God descending upon this mountain. In fact, this scene is so awesome, it's terrifying. The people go on and say, Moses... If you don't mind, thanks for bringing God, but if you don't mind, can you talk to him and keep him away from us? We don't want him to, to, to kill us. This is what they say. This is awesome, but we're, this is a little overwhelming. This is a little heavy. We're feeling the heaviness of the situation. And what's happening is they are getting a tiny taste of the glory and majesty and splendor and grandeur of who God is. The Hebrew word for glory is kavod. It's spelled K A. B-O-D, it's pronounced kavod. It means glory, splendor, abundance. But get this, it means heaviness. It means weight. So these people, when they're experiencing all this fire and all the smoke, they're experiencing the heaviness of God, the weight of God. God is so glorious, you can feel it. It's, it's heavy. Remember a couple weeks ago, there was a lightning storm near, near uh, my house. And we're sitting in the house and we're eating dinner. And it's really dark, and all of a sudden you see this flicker outside. Bam. I was like, what was that? About 20 seconds later, it happened again. It keeps happening. So we go outside, and we're looking at all of these flickers and this lightning shooting across the sky. And it was, it was weird. It was awesome, and yet it was terrifying. It's like it's so awesome that you've got to look at it, but it's so scary that you want to run into the house. And it's this, this, this tension between being frozen solid watching it but then being scared to death where you should get inside the house. What is that? It's the heaviness of God. You're experiencing a taste of God's glory and God's splendor. And God is so amazing that you got, you're, you're transfixed on it, but it's so amazing you're almost, almost scared. It's just, it's heavy. It's overwhelming. That is the glory and majesty of God. And all of creation was created to declare God's glory. We talked about this a little bit last week. Everything, every tree, Every leaf on every plant, every rock, 
all of it declares the glory of God. The solar system declares the glory of God. The galaxy that is expanding at the speed of light, these statistics might be off, but jive with me. The galaxy that is expanding at the speed of light, that has more stars that can even be counted or even conceived. The galaxy that contains the sun, which is 90 million miles away and 90 million times greater than the earth, that galaxy screams the glory of God. It screams of God's infiniteness, that God is infinitely wise, that God is infinitely powerful, that God is infinitely great. God is infinitely greater than the infinitely great universe he created. The solar system screams of the glory of God. And then we have human beings who were created in God's image to declare his glory. In fact, human beings, the only thing created in the image of God are the creatures most glorifying to God. Think about that. We were created to glorify God more than the sun. Incredible to think about. We, humans, created in the image and likeness of God. And we've been given that privilege, and that privilege was initially given to Adam and Eve, created by God's grace and for God's glory. So let's talk about how mankind, how humans actually declare and reflect the glory of God. Three ways that we'll look at. There's more than three, but there's three specific ones I want to talk about today. Man was made to glorify God by representing his authority and sovereignty. It's worth writing down. Man was created to glorify God by representing his authority and sovereignty. Man was created to glorify God by reflecting his worth. And man was created to glorify God by reflecting his holiness. Write them down. I'll revisit them throughout the day so you can, if you didn't write them down, you can, you can catch up in a little bit. So let's talk about how we were created to glorify God by representing his authority and his sovereignty. God made Adam and Eve in his image and in his likeness. And part of that meant them being his representatives. So God formed Adam and Eve. He placed them in the garden and he gave them two rules. I want you to uh, subdue and I want you to rule. He said other things to be fruitful, multiply, but he said, I want you to subdue and I want you to rule. God said, listen, as creatures made in my image, I'm imparting some of my authority unto you. And I want to exercise my authority over creation through you. You are going to fill and subdue and rule over this creation. You're going to be my representatives. So as you rule all that I've made, you are going to represent my authority and my sovereignty. What's interesting, what I found is that a lot of the commandments and mandates that God gave to Adam and Eve are further on or, or fulfilled or continued by the church. The things that God made Adam and Eve for, the commandments he gave them, are fulfilled by us. Let's look at it. Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 to 8. Write that down. Matthew 10, verses 1 to 8. And then we'll also look at verses 16 to 20. Very good. Turn those Bibles. Bring that Bible to church. Matthew 10. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them what? Authority. Gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. And he gives all the names. Skip ahead to verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Skip ahead now to verse 18. Verse 18. Jesus says, on my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what you will say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. This passage very closely resembles what was going on in Genesis. God said, Adam and Eve, I'm making you. I'm giving you my authority, and I'm going to exercise my authority through you. You're going to be my representatives. Twelve apostles, I'm giving you authority, and you're going to exercise authority over the dominion of darkness over the schemes of the enemy. You're going to exercise my authority. You're going to act as my representatives. I'm giving you my authority, and you're going to be my representative as you exercise that authority. It's the same exact thing, church. So how do we then, as the people of God today, practically live this out? 
How do we act as representatives on earth, as God's uh, representatives of God's sovereignty and God's authority? Sit tight, give me 15 minutes, and we will discuss that. Let's go on to the next one. How was mankind made to reflect God's worth? Included in God's glory is God's worthiness, God's worth. That God is worthy of all praise, that God is worthy of all adoration, that God is worthy of all our affections, that God is worthy. That's part of his glory. It's that God is worthy. God is worthy of all those things and then some. Write down Psalm chapter 100, verses 1 to 5. This psalmist gets the worthiness of God. Psalm chapter 100, verses 1 to 5. If you open your Bible, right in the middle of Psalms is right in the middle of your Bible. It says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord God is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all the generations. If you were to sum up this psalm, it would be give God what he is due. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our worship. Give him what he's due. That's what the psalmist says. The apostle Paul gets this. The apostle Paul understands the worthiness of God Write down Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 to 8. Philippians 3, 7 to 8. Paul gives a list of his spiritual accolades, and then he gives us this, these two sentences. Philippians 3, 7 to 8. Paul says, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Paul says Christ is worth giving up everything for. Christ is worth losing everything for. The things of this world I consider garbage. I consider them rubbish in comparison to Christ. Paul gets it, the worthiness of God. Paul says, look, compared to Christ, the riches of this world are straight trash. Compared to Christ, the fame of this world is straight trash. Compared to Christ, the affirmation of men, the affirmation of women is straight trash. I give it all up for the purpose of gaining Christ. He's worthy. Question, church, do our lives reflect this the worthiness of Christ, that Christ is worth giving up everything for. Do our lives declare that? How do our lives do? How do we live a life that declares the worthiness of Christ? I'll tell you a secret. I've said that before. I'll tell you again. My secret agenda in leading this church is to get you to buy into that, to live a life that declares how worthy Christ is. For us to be a group of people that declare to the world, Jesus is worth losing everything for. That's what I'm trying to do here. By God's grace, to form a people whose lives reflect the worthiness of Christ. How do we do that practically? Give me 10 minutes, and we will talk about that. Let's move on to the next one. Man was created to reflect God's glory by reflecting his morality. By reflecting his morality. What does that mean? God's morality are the moral attributes of God. So God's goodness, God's love, God's grace, God's holiness. As we live lives and our lives reflect those attributes, it's glorifying to God. Let's look at Matthew, go to Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 to 16. It's a common passage. Matthew 5, 14 to 16. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. 
Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others. Why? So that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So, when God's goodness is seen in his people, it points back to him and gives him glory. When God's love is seen in his people, it points back to him and gives him glory. And when God's holiness is is seen in his people. It points back to him and gives him glory. That piece of holiness is an underemphasized attribute of God today. Holiness means to be set apart. So God is holy. God is immutably holy, meaning God is unceasingly holy. God will be holy now and forevermore he remains holy. Now, holiness is set apartness. So what is God set apart from? It's a lot of different things, but specifically, God is set apart from sin. Again, God is set apart from sin, meaning there is no sin in the being of God. God doesn't hover around sin. God doesn't flirt with sin. God doesn't commit sin. God is eternally set apart from sin. So we as his followers, he calls us to be set apart from sin as well. When you look at the the, the Pauline epistles, which are Paul's letters to the churches, almost every one of them talks about the need for the people of God to live holy lives, to be set apart from sin. Write down Colossians chapter 3, Colossians 3, and I'll read verses 5 to 10. Okay. We'll start on verse 5. Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 to 10. Paul says, put to death... Therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, which could also be, say, your sinful nature, put it to death. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and image of its creator. Paul says, have no inclining, inclining, inclin, inclinate, don't sin, Paul says. <laughs> don't sin. Have no part with it. Don't have an ounce in it. God is holy. Be holy. This is not a self-righteousness thing. This is an image of God thing. This is a holiness thing. You were created to glorify God by reflecting his holiness and reflecting his morality. And that means pursuing a life that doesn't dabble in with any sort of sin. That's what we're called to do. So let's reset for a moment. Man was made by God and for God. Man was made by God's grace, for God's glory. You were created to glorify God, which means, amongst other things, three things, representing his authority and sovereignty on the earth by reflecting his holiness, and also by reflecting his worth in how you live. Again, something to ponder this week. How many people do you know live like this? Is this how I live? And not just is my life glorifying to God, but specifically, is the glory of God my highest and greatest pursuit in life? Is that what wakes me up in the morning? Is that what motivates me to do things? When I make money, Or when I have my spouse, when I raise my children, or when I go to class, is the glory of God what's driving me, or is it something else? If you are conformed to the pattern of this world, or even if you're just living in our country, that's not going to be your mentality by default. if, if, If you live by default, you are going to pursue everything but the glory of God. That's what you're conditioned to do. We live for our pleasures. We live for our comforts. We live for our personal goals and our pursuits. We live for our glory. We live for our plans. We don't live for the glory of God. Humanity doesn't live for the glory. Humanity lives for humanity. It's what you're trained to do. But how has that worked out for humanity? Living for yourself, being your own God, living for your pleasures. How does that work out? It doesn't work out because you're not fulfilling your purpose. God in his glory has made everything to reflect his glory. That when God sees creation and when he sees people, he'd be pleased in the image of himself. Don't raise your hand. 
I'd encourage you not to raise your hand or not to admit it, but I would gather that some of us in this room enjoy looking in the mirror. When we look in the mirror, we get pleasure out of that. We like what we see. When we leave a mirror, our desire is to get to the next mirror as quickly as possible. <laughs> I'm not going to say any names, but I know a couple people right now who would fall in that category. And you may say, okay, that sounds narcissistic. Well, it, it, it probably is a little bit, but it's totally fitting for God. God is glorious, and all glory and honor praise belongs to him. And so it's totally fitting for that God to look at himself and see a reflection of himself and to be pleased in it because it all belongs to him. So we need to glorify God. We should glorify God. Great. How? I'm with you, Pastor Scotty. Glorify God. Okay. How do I do this practically? I'll tell you right now, there's two, two, two statements that I would give you. Here's the first one. Write it down. A life that is glorifying to God is a life lived by faith. Again, you want to glorify God? Okay. A life that is glorifying to God is a life lived by faith. A life glorifying to God is not a life lived in human strength. A life glorifying to God is not a life done that does good deeds in human strength. Why? Because that type of life lived in human strength doesn't point to God. It points to you or it points to a human when humans operate in human strength, it doesn't reflect God. It reflects human strength. But a life lived by faith in God now reflects the strength of God and now is glorifying to God because it points to God. A life that is glorifying to God is a life lived by faith. A life that is pleasing to God is a life lived by faith, by empowerment of the Spirit of God. Write down Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 to 6. Hebrews 11, verses 1 to 6. Now, faith is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what was seen, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he's dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. Verse 6, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. God is not pleased in our efforts. God is not pleased in our good deeds. He's not glorified in that. It's important to understand, church. God is pleased in the one who is in us. God is pleased in the works done by the one who is in us. God is pleased and glorified by Christ in us. And how is Christ in us? By faith. Christ is in you by faith. It's by faith that your sins have been forgiven. It's by faith that his spirit lives in you. It's by faith that you perform good deeds. It's by faith that you put to death the old sinful man and allow the new creation to come up in you. It's by faith that we have marriages that reflect God's goodness. It's by faith that you train up children in the way they should go. It's all done by faith. What am I by faith? By dependence upon God, by reliance upon God. It's by faith that you live a life that is pleasing and glorifying to God. That's the first thing. Let me stay on. Go to Galatians chapter 2. Paul gets this. By faith. Galatians 2, verses 19 to 20. Galatians 2, 19 to 20. A life that is pleasing to God is a life lived by faith. I'm having trouble finding Galatians. 
Galatians, Ephesians, but I cannot pages stuck together. It's in there somewhere, huh? All right, Galatians 2. Just so you know, I know where Galatians is. I'm just trying to show. <laughs> just in case anyone was wondering. Just kidding. Pages are stuck together. Okay, Galatians 2, 19 to 20. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. Verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Okay, Paul says Christ lives in me. How does Christ live in me? Listen. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul is dead to the law, and Christ lives in him. And Christ lives in him by faith. Church, if you want to live a life that's glorifying to God, you live it by faith. You don't live it by trying harder. You don't live it by more discipline. You don't live it by managing your sin. You live a life that is pleasing to God by faith in the Son of God, by dependence in reliance upon Christ, number one. Number two, how do you live a life that's glorifying to God? A life that is glorifying to God is a life that is surrendered to God. Write that down. A life that is glorifying to God is a life that is surrendered to God. The most glorifying life ever lived was Christ. Jesus modeled perfect faith. Jesus also modeled perfect surrender. Faith and surrender are intimately married. They can't be separated. So the person who says, I have faith in Christ, must necessarily surrender his life or her life to Christ. They're intimately connected. The cross that you see is a picture of perfect faith expressed through perfect surrender. Jesus surrendered his life to the Father in loving obedience to the point of bearing the wrath of the Father. That cross is a picture of surrender. Surrender is the evidence of your faith. Now, I want want to let that soak in for a moment. I always tell people, faith in Christ cannot be separated from following Christ. If someone really has faith in Christ, then they'll be following him. What that means is that the evidence of faith is fruit It's surrender. It's not a profession. We're going to talk about salvation in a couple weeks. And how you know the marks of someone who truly is saved, let me tell you, it's not a profession of faith. Just because someone says, I'm a believer, that does not mean they're saved, church. And I say this with a loving spirit because so often I see people who bear no fruit of God in their life whatsoever. And yet loved ones will say, oh, they're saved. He's in there. Listen. Listen. That's not what the Bible teaches. We're not saved by works. We're saved by faith. But the evidence of that is fruit. Fruit comes by surrender. Jesus was the perfect example of a life surrendered to God. Are our lives surrendered to God? Listen, let me just give you a quick, you know, um, parentheses in this. That doesn't mean you're never going to sin again. It doesn't mean that you, you, you're, 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 you're perfect, but a life of surrender is a life of continual surrender to Christ. So God is teaching you to put off this area of your life, and you may put it off, and it may come back, and you wrestle with it, and you repent of it, and you feel sorrow for it, and you confess it, and God gives you grace to overcome it. And then this area of your life is God is revealing to you that you need to start taking this on, and you try, but you stumble, and you feel conviction, but then you pray, and you receive God's forgiveness, and you confess it, and then you keep it. Like, that's a, that's a life of surrender. It's a process. It's both now and it's continual. I've surrendered my life to Christ, and I continue to surrender my life to Christ. That's what Christianity is. It's this life of faith in Christ expressed by surrender to Christ and continual surrender to Christ. And that's what mankind was created for. So let's, re- let's rewind. This was the charge given to Adam and Eve in the garden. They were created by God's grace. And you can go ahead and get the kids. They are created by God's grace. By God's loving kindness, he formed them. And he made them distinct and equal. He made them to glorify him. Adam and Eve were called to glorify God by reflecting God's authority and sovereignty on the earth. Adam and Eve were created to glorify God by reflecting God's moral character to the earth. That when angels would look upon Adam and Eve, they would get a taste of who God is and see them acting as his representatives. But something happened in the garden that sort of 
disrupted that whole situation and caused it to not to play out the way it should have. Sin entered into the world. We're going to look at what that means next week. We're going to look at the doctrine of sin. What does it have to do with us? You were made to glorify God. The reason why we arranged the whole service differently last minute is because I felt like it would be most glorifying to God for us to sing at the end. I never want us to sing aimlessly or out of ritual. I never want us to put it on idle pilot and we come in, we sit in the same seat, the same time, we have the same format. I don't want that. And worship, you can go, go, go ahead and come up. If we're talking about the glory of God today and how we were created purely for God's glory, I want us to understand that as we go into this time of worship. So we're not singing songs right now. We're worshiping God. We're fulfilling our purpose. We're declaring God's worth, God's worthiness back to him in the form of song. So I'd invite you to stand and let's give him his due. Amen.